Okay, the time is 2 p.m. and I'm going to call the Tuesday, April 18th, 2023 Committee of the Whole meeting to order. And the first item that we have on our agenda is the land acknowledgement. The City of Fort Saskatchewan is located within Treaty 6 territory in Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Nihuac, Dene, Blackfoot, Salto, Nakota Sioux, and Métis. And we acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. It is because of our treaty relationship that we can live, work, and play on Treaty 6 territory. Thank you. Okay, so the first item that we have is approval of the March 21st Committee of the Whole Minutes. Councillor Macon. I'll move that we approve the minutes of the March 21st, 2023 Committee of the Whole meeting as circulated. Thank you. Are there any errors or omissions? Not seeing any, I will close the motion. Please cast your vote. That is carried. Thank you very much. And the first item that we have for our presentations is the Alberta's Industrial Heartland update from Mark Plamondon and David McLean. So if you'd like to join us, welcome. And just for your information, when you're talking, the cameras are behind me. So even you may have a presentation over there and people are watching you from there. Okay. So welcome. And we have 10 minutes set up for your presentation. Okay. Push the button. There can, you go. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Can hear Thank you, you now. very much, Mayor Catch, and good afternoon, everybody. Okay, 10 minutes. I'm going to... Uh, I see the clock time here. We'll move quite quickly. So thank you very much. It is a real pleasure to be in front of you here again. I'm joined by David McLean. He is our Director of External Relations. I would just like to share with you really some updates of what's happening in Alberta's industrial heartland. So I think you're familiar with who we are. We are a partnership 24 years uh, in, uh, since uh, we were formed and our, our members are City of Fort Saskatchewan, City of Edmonton, Sturgeon, Strathcona and Lamont counties. So what I wanted to really focus on was sort of the three strategic pillars that we have uh, for the Industrial Heartland Association. The, if you look at the right on this slide, the first is to promote project opportunities in Alberta's industrial heartland. And that is one of the main sort of reasons to be for our association. Our, our, we are a, uh, largely a marketing organization which is um, working with international companies and traveling, traveling to a number of international events to promote the region and highlight the competitive advantages of Alberta and the industrial heartland to attract foreign direct uh, investment to the region. We also have um, another pillar which is called improve the business case for Alberta's industrial heartland and this really is talking about competitiveness and how do we work with the provincial and federal governments to improve competitiveness of this region. So you know, we have some advantage when we're working with companies. We're learning what they're seeing in other jurisdictions. We're learning um, on being in the front line and talking to companies where the pinch points are and, and where our competitiveness weaknesses are. And so and then we can work with provincial and federal governments, whether that's infrastructure improvements or incentives or even frameworks, regulatory frameworks to improve the competitiveness of our jurisdiction. And then finally... We are, our third strategic pillar is to advance uh, social license and community support. And we do that largely in partnerships with um, other uh, industrial and, and uh, other associations in the region, really to continue to build trust between the community and the in industries that are operating in this region. And the, 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 the intent ultimately is that, you know, when, as companies are looking around the world to invest in their next in project, Investing in a jurisdiction that is, is welcoming is obviously a m much more attractive than if uh, the community is not. And so a lot of time is spent on uh, building community support. And we're very fortunate in this part of the world to have very strong community support for development. So in just a little more detail um, for promoting project opportunities, so our sort of four main strategies here. Uh, one is to, in the top left corner of this um, 
um, illustration on the right, we attend international events, conferences that aggregate investors. We leverage the international trade offices with uh, the government of Alberta and government of Canada to access high potential companies. We do targeted outreach through corporate office visits, and we also have significant electronic engagement and advertising, which funnel opportunities to our marketing team. Um, I'll talk a little bit about growth opportunities in another slide. We also have an, a significant amount of social media coverage. Our um, director of communications, Carly Conway, does a number of, of we do a number of um, uh, promotions that promote the industrial heartland, a, no, a number of campaigns that roll out uh, internationally and, and nationally, which really uh, talk about the advantages and what, what can happen here in the industrial heartland. And we also track the market sentiment every quarter and we, you know, we almost all the time see 100% uh, neutral or positive sentiment about Alberta's industrial heartland. So again, it goes to that community support that we have for this region. So where we're seeing growth opportunities right now, um, and really over the last sort of five years, where most of the growth opportunities in this region are largely with respect to upgrading and processing of natural gas and natural gas liquids. And so on this slide here, on the, on the very left, um, significant amount of interest in upgrading methane. So methane is the largest component of natural gas. So methane, upgrading to methanol or ammonia or hydrogen or other forms of um, hydrogen carriers, that is uh, a significant area of growth and lots of interest, particularly from um, international investors, particularly Japan and Korea, very interested in, our, in the methane and the upgrading of methane here to produce products for export to those markets. We also have, particularly, this is of good interest to the city of Fort Saskatchewan, tremendous interest in upgrading ethane through to ethylene and polyethylene. So you're, you're well aware of uh, Dow is, is studying a, the world's first net zero um, ethylene manufacturing facility here in Fort Saskatchewan. That uh, really is in the ethane space. So significant interest in ethane and then propane as well. And if we go to the far right, uh, far right is, is a little bit different. These are all, I'm going to say, more diversified opportunities for the industrial heartland. And we've seen more interest in this lately than what you've seen sort of in the last few years. So there's significant interest in biofuels and biorefining, um, lithium processing, waste to energy projects, renewable power, projects in the battery material space. So most of these projects are smaller in capital dollar amount, but, but interesting from a diversification standpoint. You know, one of the objectives of our work is to try to diversify the number of projects here as much as possible. The the, the benefit of that, of course, is having a more resilient uh, economy here that ultimately leads to uh, more resilient communities. The more diversified we can be, I think the better off we are as, as a whole. So this, this is our area of our growth opportunities. And when our, our business development team are out in the world talking to companies, these are sort of the main areas of focus that we're seeing right now. And so the projects that we're actually have happening right now, so the inner, on the far left inner pipeline, this project actually is, I'm going to say their construction is complete. They have announced that they've reached commercial production. So the inner pipeline facility, this is about a $5 billion project, which um, takes propane and upgrades it all the way to polypropylene. That project is now operational. There's two other projects under construction. Wolf is um, constructing a facility, a fractionation facility, and, and uh, Shell has partnered with Silicon Ranch to construct a 58 megawatt solar farm. And then the rest of the projects that we have here we're showing are currently under study. So Dow project would be a multi-billion dollar massive project. It would be their first net zero ethylene manufacturing facility in the world. It would triple the capacity of the site here in Fort Saskatchewan. Shell and Mitsubishi are partnering to study hydrogen for export uh, in the form of ammonia to Japan, as well as Itochu, Petronas, and Interpipeline. So these are multi-billion dollar type projects. And, and similarly, on the next slide, a number of projects under study, Suncor and Atco are studying um, the production of hydrogen in the region, Plains Midstream here in Fort Saskatchewan, they are also studying the expansion of their fractionation facilities. Pembina has also started some uh, 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 pre-sanctioning activities for their fractionation facility. 
Alpin Sun is looking at a solar farm. CN and Kiera announced an MOU to study a centralized rail loadout facility for clean export. Uh, clean energy exports and Fortune Minerals is also looking at a cobalt um, um, refining facility here in the industrial heartland. So these are a number of projects. I think the main message for you is, is I would say that the industrial heartland area is probably the busiest it's ever been. The number of world scale companies that are studying this region for their next major capital investment, I think is probably the busiest that we've ever seen it. Um, it they re companies really are taking advantage of that low cost feedstock and the carbon capture and sequestration capability in this region to produce low-cost, low-carbon products. The second pillar is to improve the business case. I just want to communicate to Council that we've conducted a number of studies every year to try to, to uh, improve the region. So we've done a number of studies on carbon markets to help companies monetize their carbon credits. We've done studies on small modular nuclear reactors, on infrastructure, as well as on developing a regulatory roadmap for this region. And on the right, it's just illustrating that we are meeting with provincial uh, elected representatives frequently, as well as federal, to highlight what's happening in the industrial heartland and to promote our projects and hopefully advocate for uh, shaping policy that is conducive for investments. The next two slides really are just about the designated industrial zone here in the industrial heartland. It is really just showing a number of milestones the government of Alberta has dedicated as has assigned Alberta's industrial heartland as Alberta's first designated industrial zone. So this is a competitive advantage. The intent is to streamline the regulatory process here to go from what could be at least 18 to 24 months to get regulatory approvals for projects, trying to get that down to six or six to eight months. And so the, the real intent is just to improve competitiveness of this region. That regulatory framework takes a while, it's complex, and the government, Alberta Environment and Parks in particular, has really looked at streamlining that. And then finally, I uh, just wanted to emphasize our work uh, with Life in the Heartland and Forder Partnership and our other partners in the region to continue to build social license and community support. Life in the Heartland, they had their first um, info eve back in November, but just uh, last week they had uh, their second info, info eve since the pandemic here at uh, in Fort Saskatchewan. It was very well attended and I think is a for it's a forum that is works really well to get message out to the community. And then with the last 10 seconds, we also have a reconciliation uh, action plan where we are working with the, f the First Nation communities in the region to build a business directory as well as to build a, a uh, engagement toolkit. So when foreign companies come to this region, we can help them with their reconcil or with their uh, engagement activities. And that was very quick, and I'm seven seconds over, so I apologize for that, Mary Ketch. <laughs> it's just fine. I didn't realize she was actually uh, timing you. <laughs> We've got some excellent presenters here this evening, uh, this afternoon, so I don't want to put that kind of pressure on you. So uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I will open it up to questions of council, if you have any. I'll kickstart uh, the one off. So as uh, investors are coming into the region, um, so what is, uh, just talk about the competitive, competitive advantage of the Alberta Industrial Heartman, Heart, mm -hmm. Heartland when you have uh, five municipalities and three associates all working together. I'll gladly do that. I think, so one of the, the one of the main advantages of working together collectively on the global stage is that, um, you know, the, the, the minutiae of the individual municipalities don't matter on the, on the global stage. What matters is access to feedstock, access to infrastructure, um, access to incentives, all of those things. And those are common for the five municipalities. So working together to uh, attract companies here really is streamlining and it's, and it's efficient is what it is. It's efficient. It sends a good message to investors that you have alignment across the municipalities in this region. And then when you couple that with aligning with the provincial government through things like the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program, and then with federal alignment with a number of incentives they've put in place now for a lot of uh, investments, you're really demonstrating full alignment between the federal, provincial, and the municipal governments in this region. And that sends a very powerful message that governments are interested in these types of projects here. So that, I think, is the main advantage of, of working collaboratively for these things. And then all the competitive advantages are the economic advantages of being here. Access to low-cost feedstock, access to carbon capture and sequestration, access to rail, access to markets, all of those things. Great, thank you. And I think that's very important for anybody who is listening or comes back on to uh, replay this. Uh, Councillor Harris, questions? 
Mark, have you uh, updated the cost of construction study that was done about five years ago in terms of the differential between uh, the Gulf Coast and uh, our area in terms of cost of construction for major projects? Has that been updated? Thank you for the question. It is in our plan to do that this year, and we are going out to uh, various uh, um, companies to do that work in the next couple of weeks. So that study will be done this year. That'll be an update. Okay, so yeah. it's still a baseline right. set of information and data against which we can still work. Exactly right. So these are the types of studies that we will do on a, on a regular basis every few years to have relevant information for investors so they understand where we sit from a capital cost perspective compared to other jurisdictions. And so we'll be doing that again this year. So they validate the, the information that we provide them, and ultimately they know where they want to go when they want to go. Right. right. I mean, in all cases, a, a, a company is going to look at it in detail, but it's the initial information that says, look, this is what our jurisdiction is all about. This is how we stack up against other jurisdictions. All companies will do their homework in detail before making a final investment decision, but it's that initial marketing and enticement of getting them to come and look at the industrial heartland. Great. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Blizzard. Thanks for the presentation. I also heard it last week at Life in the Heartland, so it was good to hear it again, though. Um, so do we find more oil is being processed in Alberta? Because it seems it was a number of years ago now, but it seemed like it, everything was being upgraded and shipped out to be done somewhere else, to be upgraded elsewhere. And to me, jobs, if they're, you know, if we can process it here, upgrade it here, we're going to get more jobs, more industry here. Um, do we find that's happening now? Well, so the simple answer is yes. With construction of the Northwest Redwater uh, Sturgeon Refinery in Sturgeon County, which is in the industrial heartland, that brought on a, a, a lot of new refine, upgrading and refining capacity into the industrial heartland. So that is a step up in terms of the oil processing capacity in the industrial heartland. So that answer is yes. And then, of course, with... Um, um, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, when that eventually comes online, there'll be more export capacity for um, bitumen to foreign markets. But that is really bypassing the industrial heartland, right? That is taking mm -hmm. bitumen from Fort Saskatchewan and taking it to markets. Oh, sorry, bitumen from Fort McMurray and taking it to markets. The capacity here in the industrial heartland for upgrading and refining has had a step jump, and that is from the NWR facility that was constructed and became operational in 2019-ish. And do we do push more than just, I mean, upgrading is one thing, but we want final product mm -hmm. made here versus made in somewhere else. That's right. And when I say upgrading, I'm, I'm, you're, you're taking, so your raw resource, mm -hmm. upgrading to an intermediate, and then in the case of the sturgeon refinery, they produce low sulfur diesel, so they produce a finished product. Good. Thank you. Excellent. So that looks like that's all the questions. So I thank you very much for coming out uh, this afternoon. Um, I also attended Life in the Heartland. Uh, what an excellent event. Um, so just uh, uh, for anybody who's watching, how often do you have those and where is the next one? So, so Life in the Heartland is a collaborative uh, effort between Alberta's Industrial Heartland Association, the Northeast Capital Industrial Association, for their partnership and in our care. And that collaborative effort, we have these community events uh, every six months. Um, the last one was just here in Fort Saskatchewan. So the next one will be in six months and probably on the other side of the river. Typically, the final location hasn't yet been determined, but typically we'll try to go back and forth between the east and west side of the river every six months. Great. And I just encourage anybody, get out to uh, see them. You have an excellent opportunity to talk to Mark and his team and of course much of industry that is participating. So thank you very much for being here today. Very good, thank you. Thank you. All right, so our next presenters are Edmonton Global Shareholder Updates. So we have Jason Rendawa and Malcolm Bruce. And we're very honored to have you here. And we have about 15 minutes. We're not going to put the timer on you, though. So. No, that's great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to see everyone. My name is Jason Randava. I am a uh, board director with Edmonton Global. 
I've been on the board since we stood the organization up back in 2018, uh, so have seen us evolve over that time frame. I also chair our uh, governance and HR committee uh, of the board. And uh, Malcolm, our uh, illustrious CEO, is with me. Um, what I thought I would do today is um, you've, got, you've had the presentation, I know, sent to you ahead of time, so we can hit some highlights. But what I really want to do is sort of stress uh, three main points with you today. And, uh, and then hopefully engage in a bit of a dialogue with you around Edmonton Global and what we're up to. So point number one is mission. Um, this organization came out of work that was done amongst regional leaders to really put together an organization that can represent the region when it goes out to market to the world. And our mission is to radically transform the economy of the region. And I can tell you... Um, <laughs> from an organization that got stood up with a with a board, but with a part-time CEO who also had a full-time and then some job and a couple of contractors, we've really seen the organization evolve significantly over the last five years. And we've moved from sort of startup phase into now actually really being able to go out and, and deliver results. Which brings me to the second point, which is about momentum. There's a significant amount of momentum that's occurring right now with the work that Global is doing. Um, throw into that last five years the pandemic, which was challenging uh, to say the least for everybody. So even in terms of uh, you know travel, engagement, um, doing any of that kind of work, we had to get creative about how to do that. The good news is I think that's finally perhaps water under the bridge, if I can knock on laminate here. Um, and we've been able to get back into doing some of the work in market that we were, were hoping to do. And there is a significant amount of momentum that's occurred over the course of the last five years and continues as we move into 2023. Um, I'll highlight an example um, that's going to dovetail into my third point about marketing. So Global started the uh, Canadian Hydrogen Conference last year. And in the first year, we had 4,000 people come out to that. Uh, from around the world. This year, we're expecting at least eight to 9,000, could be as high as 10. And then the year after, they're, they're projecting into the teens. And so part of the issue is that's fantastic. There's incredible amounts of interest. We're now having some logistics challenges in terms of where the heck is everybody going to stay if we get that many people coming into the region. But that's a good problem to have. Um, so again, lots and lots of momentum, not only on actual engagement on deals, but on the third point, which is marketing. I mean, the big thing about global, if you think about our mission is, as we go into markets out there in the world, there are some places that are very familiar with this region. There are others that ha haven't really heard of it. And so depending on which country or which er jurisdiction we go into, there is a uh, level setting that needs to be done in terms of it could be just straight introduction about what is this place? Where are you? They might have heard about the hockey. They might have heard about things like that. They might have heard about um, oil sands or in some markets, tar sands and things like that. So there's an awareness and education aspect that's required. And that's starting. And I can tell you where we've had um, a lot of traction, particularly in certain markets in the, in the Middle East, we're moving past not only who are you, but they understand the value proposition. And we have active interest and investment that's happening on the ground in the region. And, and it just shows you when you put dedicated effort together with good, strong, capable people that are on our team, led by Malcolm, in market with other leaders participating in the region, we're, we're getting real interest because there is a very strong value proposition here. Um, maybe what I can do just to highlight a couple of things is move to, sorry for going through these quickly, but I think um, this is a, a slide I'd like to highlight. So in the past five years, 2.4 billion of investments, um, almost 3,500 jobs. And obviously, you know, it's not a straight line. We have certain years where we get major projects working with our partners here that are significant in other years, you know, you're cultivating. But what I can tell you is that trajectory is sloping uh, up and to the right. And that's a fantastic, fantastic result um, as we kind of move forward. So with that, I thought what I would do is open it up for questions. And if you want to highlight anything specific through the document that was circulated to you, happy to get into that in more detail. Um, but really would like to understand questions that you may have and thoughts on your mind and really looking forward to that kind of an engagement with you. Okay, thank you very much. So, Councillor Macon, you're first. Thanks for being here today, both of you. Um, 
I'll throw two questions out at you and then you can just take them away. So my first one is um, the results uh, are fantastic. I was just wondering if you could provide any specific examples uh, within that of, um, of some wins for Edmonton Global. And then the other one was, um, I know here in Fort Saskatchewan a few years ago when we made the decision to uh, invest in um, the initiative with the Edmonton International Airport, that that decision was controversial, controversial for some. And so I was just wondering if you can give us a little update on uh, the success of that um, okay. initiative as well. Thank you. So maybe one of the examples I'll provide you as it relates to Fort Saskatchewan in terms of the economic impact is the air products decision that was announced recently. So um, I've got a document that was provided to me by management that talks about construction related GDP in the Edmonton region specific to Fort Saskatchewan, $14 million of impact. Labor income for the Edmonton region, $102 million. Um, construction related employment in terms of FTEs, 970. Uh, annual operating related GDP, $153 million. Annual operations related labor income, 26 million. So, I mean, you can see that, that some of this is, I mean, there's benefits all the way across the board. Part of what I think people have to understand is, you know, not every investment decision is equal. So we've got some that come with lots of construction, lots of physical plant, um, very labor intensive jobs, not just through the construction phase, but also after and operating. That's ideal. You'll have others that might not need a significant amount of full-time employment post-build. So you think of something like a data center. And once a data center is built <laughs> for the space that it takes up, you don't really need a significant amount of people to, to operate it, even though it can be something that economically from a revenue and then perhaps even a tax perspective can, can kick quite a lot of revenue out. But as far as employment... You know, it, it depends. So part of what we try and look at is the entire, you know, bailiwick. And in some cases, you don't have choice, but we're aware of those things and the team works on that as they're going out. Um, maybe, Malcolm, I can let you answer the um, the regional air services. Sure, but I'll also just sort of add into what uh, Jason has said already in terms of deals. So uh, there's two I'd like to highlight that are um, that have been recent wins. The first one was uh, two weeks ago on Friday, there was a public announcement for Stony Plain uh, in English Bay, which is a, uh, a chocolate manufacturer that's uh, relocating out of Delta, BC into the Stony Plain neighborhood. And that's a $30 million build initially with 70 jobs coming in. Um, and our part that we ended up playing was a partnership, as I think Mark in, a, in the previous presentation talked about, was we're not islands onto ourselves. We have to work Work collaboratively to get that. So part of it was the investment growth fund that the province of Alberta now has to help close deals. Uh, they contributed $2.14 million into that deal. So that's how that one came across the finish line. So it was really good and great for Stony Plain. The other one was uh, we had a conversation with the Brazilian uh, Canadian Chamber of Commerce. They have an office they've just opened in Eastern Canada, and then they decided that they wanted to set one up in Western Canada. We convinced them that Edmonton region was the best place to do so. So they opened up with just one person, but already two companies from Brazil have now landed in the Edmonton region through that funnel. And there's another 40 believe it or not, in the pipeline. So really it was one person that they set up a shop and now there's potentially 40 new Brazilian companies that are going to come into the Edmonton region to the point where we actually had the Brazilian Canadian ambassador to Brazil here a month ago visiting to see why uh, the Edmonton region was a place that all these Brazilian companies were thinking about. Uh, in terms of Regional Air Services Opportunity Fund, as you know, it was a um, defined requirement to help us accelerate out of COVID and a return to direct flights to different destinations around the, the, the country and beyond. Uh, Pre-COVID, we had 52 direct destinations. During COVID, when the airport was shut down to all international passenger traffic, we had 13. I can proudly say today we're at 55 and growing. And part of that is because um, the Regional Air Services Opportunity Fund showed two things. One, a commitment, financial commitment by the region, because all 14 member municipalities for Edmonton Global uh, stepped up. 
but also more importantly, the regional collaboration that occurred uh, in defining what the requirement was going to be. So the airlines have said to us, uh, what really we liked about this whole thing is that the community has said, we're going to support this program to start to fill seats so that when we're flying, we know that we've got the support of the community, not just the financial incentive for this period. Um, so at the update at the AGM on Thursday, we'll be providing a more fulsome update, but essentially we're, uh, we're looking at a total of five business cases that have been approved um, by the board for um, flow of funds to support certain uh, business cases. And that leaves us with about 5.6 million in our final year, which I suspect will go uh, from what I see of the pipeline in terms of airlines. But to put it in perspective, because we were first, um, both Winnipeg and Ottawa have looked at our model of the Regional Air Services Opportunity Fund, really liked what they saw, anteed up millions of dollars and have had no uh, success in joining the airlines. Because the reality is, is the airlines still have capacity gaps and that uh, because we were first, we were actually able to see some outcomes with the fund uh, as opposed, unfortunately, for Winnipeg and Ottawa. They haven't had the same success we have had. Great. Councillor Harris. Respecting we work in a uh, and live in a global economy, what do you see as the primary area that we compete against the most? Obviously, we have various strategic benefits and we have probably some deficiencies we have to overcome, but who are our primary competitors? Are you able to pin it down to one or two that you kind of work against the most? That's that's a that is a tough question. I mean, it really depends on what sector you're talking about, right? So obviously, if you're talking energy, um, we compete, you know, with the Middle East, we compete with the U.S. even. The, the challenge with that has been, as we know, it's takeaway capacity. That's That's been such a problem for us. And the entire sector has been underinvested in for, you know, for years now, particularly through COVID. The other challenge you're getting now is the ESG pressure. On, I mean, even the Royal Bank, who's the most active provider of capital in the country is under fire for, you know, funding energy, oil, you know, traditional investments that would happen here in this area. So in some ways, I would say we're almost competing against ourselves, depending on, on, on what you define as the competitor, right? When you think about public opinion, um, agriculture, again, you know, you look at the, like, what do we produce and, 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 uh, and, you know, what crops specifically. So, um, the good news or bad news, I guess, is the Ukraine uh, with the war going on is is that agricultural basket is significantly impaired. So, you know, knock on wood, if we have good weather and we have good crops here, we should benefit from that. I think the biggest thing, though, in agriculture, from my perspective, and Malcolm can weigh in on this, is value add. We continue to do what we've been doing in energy forever. And I know in the previous discussion, you made a comment about, you know, can we upgrade here? Same same issue in agriculture. We're really good at growing things, putting them in a car and shipping them off somewhere. And then somebody makes the bread or makes the pasta, makes the whatever, and sells it back to us. So we need to figure out a better way to value add those products on the ground here. Um, we use Holland as an example in terms of dollars spent and the amount of value added investment that happens locally. We're not close to that yet. And then there are other sectors, you know, um, Global supply chain and logistics, that's something actually where I think um, as much as we may be quote unquote landlocked, there's a very unique value proposition that the region has and is currently in process. Can't really disclose a lot of what's going on there because of the significance of it. But what I can tell you is there is some in very, very exciting discussions happening between global and some partners. Um, it, will, it will put us on the global map. And it's unique to inland, the ability to sort of transport across this continent and what it can mean for us. And it does play into the, into the, the, uh, the ports as well on the water. So that's a very exciting opportunity. Um, AI and tech, that's, and again, that, that whole space is moving so quickly. So yes, we have Amy, we've got the U of A and all that stuff, but I mean, all of this chat GBT, and what's happened recently, and you've got the major players that are now involved. I mean, Microsoft made a huge investment in those guys. That space is is rapidly changing. Um, so what used to be sort of passive programs, you know, high data throughput, helping make some decisions, you're now moving into things that are dovetailing across into robotics and stuff. So we have some talent here, for sure. 
do we have the scale? One of the things I worry about is the scale. And when we lost places like DeepMind that decided they were going to shut this office down but keep a few of the other ones, I mean, we've got some work to do. So it's, again, moving it out of the the academic realm into the commercial realm. But we're, we're optimistic when we do have some investments and some people that are coming uh, and have been deciding they want to put put it uh, put roots down here. And I think a big thing where we need to lean in on that one is lifestyle. You know, not a lot of want to pe people now don't want to go to San Francisco and some of those places like they used to. So there, that's a whole other education around why would you move to the region here? And so quality of life, safety, you know, access to facilities, all of those kinds of things, even though we've had our own challenges, when you look on a relative basis towards some of the other places that people have an opportunity to go, it's really getting on the radar so people make those decisions and leveraging the folks that have made that decision and the networks that they play in so that that word spreads more and more and more. And hence, that's ultimately the tool in which we bring people here. We show them the value. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Blizzard. Thanks for your... Just a second here. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, so as the or your organization matures, um, initially you reach out and you're trying to let people know, come on here, here's what we're, how we can help you, here's what we have. Um, do you find people are going the opposite and reaching out to you instead of you to them as they are more aware of this area or your organization? Yeah, I'll let Malcolm weigh in. I mean, my, my view as a board member is yes, that is happening in certain markets where we've made that investment. So where the relationships have been established people have come on the visits we've made the the investment in all of that time and they've deployed capital that's starting now where we do have things that are coming more inbound but I, Malcolm can give you more color on that yeah I, I think you know the work that the entire region's done around the hydrogen uh, hub and the Edmonton region hydrogen hub has been very impactful uh, and I think the scale up of the you're seeing of the conference itself is a, an outcome of why people are excited about the various things that are going on here from production, you know, to uh, infrastructure development, to pipeline technology. I was just in Japan talking to Sumutomo, who is a trading house, and they're doing work with CIFR and Alberta Innovates on the pipeline integrity and things like that. So there's a bunch of what I would call interconnections and interrelationships that are occurring uh, that are starting to drive some of the momentum. I would also say to you that um, we have a value proposition now that more and more people are coming here that it's not just about hydrogen, for example. So there's a gentleman's son that showed up last year at the hydrogen convention. Uh, he's out of the Middle East. His father's net worth is about $200 billion a year. Um, he buys 1.3 million tons of Canadian canola every year, the largest importer of Canadian wheat. And he hadn't been back in this region for over 20 years. But his son said, no, you got to come and see what's going on in this region. It's incredible. He showed up in July and looked at seven different ag deals. So, you know, the, the, the emotional attachment occurred at the hydrogen convention, but the, the net benefits start to accrue in other sectors and other things because they start to see the value. And we can talk until we're blue in the face out there about why this region, but until they come here, it's hard to really explain the net value, right? Because we're not top of mind for most investors. But it's starting. You're starting to see a little bit more of people thinking in the back of their mind, oh, there's another option. It's not just whatever area they're you know, used to. Yeah, 100% agree. I just spent four or six weeks overseas. Um, I can tell you Korea, uh, Japan, Taiwan, their first option when you talk about your question about who we're competing against is Australia, right? They have a natural tendency. So our mission is to say from Tokyo or Seoul to um, Australia's nine sailing days, from Tokyo and Seoul to Prince Rupert is nine sailing days. Right. So when you start to talk about distance and what do those three countries have also in common, they have a real challenge in carbon storage. So right now, Korea is essentially packaging up their carbon, shipping it to Australia and sticking it down uh, oil and gas wells. And we're saying, you know, there are other options than just Australia. So that kind of message, I think, is starting to resonate. And you will see we're hosting a, um, a, a, a dinner for just the Japanese by and large, just the Japanese investors that are coming in uh, at the convention next week, a private dinner for 30 of them, just to focus on why Canada is a better option than Australia. Um, so that's part of what we're trying to do. Good. Good luck. 
Great. I'm going to jump in for the next question. So just leave that slide up. So as Edmonton Global is bringing in this new investment, you talk about one brings in 40, et cetera, et cetera. Do you track uh, land supply availability and, and you know, uh, land availability for, for brick and mortar versus land availability for food and agriculture? So yes, and this good, great question. Thanks, Mayor. Um, uh, the bottom line is, again, we have a number of partners in the space, right? So there are various partners we try and uh, garner that information. So individual municipalities have a really good idea of what's service land and what's not service land and what's been approved for certain uses in that land. So it's helpful for us to know so that when we're going into market, we can say, there are 14 service land parcels of from 10 acres to 200 acres that are available in the region so that potential investors know where the serviceable land is or where there's unserviceable land, but say there's rail spurs or there's access to water, whatever the key component is going to be for that particular investment decision. So those are the kind of partners that we are working with, including the industrial heartland that have the access to that information. So the bottom line is yes, is it as sophisticated as it needs to be? Not yet. And part of the reason why is because our, our site selector tool is what we're calling it is only as good as the information we get to put into it. So one of the projects that we're working with now is BOMA uh, is to see if they would be willing to take on that project uh, because the commercial realtors have a very good idea of all the real estate that's available here and see if they'll take on the website, maintain it, but just link it to the Edmonton Global and others, whoever want it, so that there's a what I would call a single source of truth in terms of land availability uh, just to start the conversation. Okay, so now I'm going to ask you the tricky question. So as an investor comes over and they see all this wide open land and they go, oh, well, I would like to be out in the middle of a certain place. What's your answer to them based on like the Edmonton Metropolitan Growth Plan as far as where businesses can go and can't go? I, again, this is why I think the partnership that we have with the Edmonton Metropolitan Region Board is a good one, right? Because the, the plan itself then designates where certain things are going to fall and where the preferred option for those are. But as you know, individual councils have that option to make adjustments uh, to what you've currently forecast if the opportunity is big enough. And so part of the way that a deal flow works is once that opportunity comes in, we actually farm it out to all the EDOs. And those EDOs that believe they can add, uh, can respond to that with a potential proposal will respond to that particular RFI, request for information from a particular investor. And then we start to refine that, uh, that package that we're going to put in front of a client. Okay. And last question I'm going to ask, because many people don't understand. So with the Albers Industrial Heartland, the mayors are the... Um, board members, but with Edmonton Global, we have a different lineup of board members. So I don't know if one of you want to talk about the advantage, and I'll tell you right now, it's an advantage just having Jason here being able to speak as opposed to another mayor. So, but uh, just talk about the advantage of having this different model. Well, okay. Uh, so I'll give you my perspective and you and I've talked about this before mayor, but, um, I think one of the differences is you don't have the dual loyalty issue that you may have in a situation where mayors are also acting as board members because you obviously as a mayor have a duty or counselor to your municipality. But when it comes to a, an organization like Global or an EMRB or pick any of those others that have a, a bit of a different flavor, um, you know, governance uh, best practices would say that you're there to act in the best interest of that organization. But that can be challenging when you also have the, you know, the pull of, well, how is this going to play in my own local municipality? Here at Global, even though some of us, you know, we've populated the board with, with, uh, with members that come across the region. So one of our criteria for selecting individuals is we don't want everybody from, let's say, Edmonton. We want to have a representative sample of directors across that span across the region. And that was built right into the articles when the organization was stood up. But they're there bringing their expertise for the benefit of Edmonton Global, for the benefit of all. 
right? So we try to look at things in the best interest of global, which is a regionally oriented organization. And I think the benefit there is you can you can make some of those uh, evaluations and decisions without the pressure that would come from you know some of what I think folks that are elected find when they also have to sit in that board seat, but they've got the pull of 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 the local concerns that could happen there, right? So um, that's definitely uh, that, and that was deliberate the, when 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 global was set up. That was a deliberate decision in terms of how the governance would work with the organization. Did you want to add anything, Malcolm? Well, and just to, to make sure that for clarity is that our structure is there's a shareholder group, which is the 14 member municipalities that designate a representation. And by and large, that's the mayors. And then there's the uh, board, which are all business leaders. And they drive the strategic direction of the organization to meet the business goals that you have set out uh, in the memorandum of association, which is the objectives of the corporation. And it's unique in this region. And I would say to you that it was very forward thinking by the mayors that actually set it up because that's allowed us to do things because I, I, I work for him. And he tells me that, you know, I want to see deals getting done and I want to get X, Y, and Z. So it's a, it's a different relationship that I have with this board as opposed to, say, a political board. And, uh, and for the reasons that you've also stated. Yeah, and maybe just to dovetail it back to the question you asked before around, around land use, but maybe to, to sort of something that's tangential to that. Uh, I was asked in a recent council meeting in another municipality, you know, what's the one thing that all of the, the municipalities could do that would really help global? And my comment back was, if you came up with a common permitting framework across the region that would provide investors certainty, irrespective of where they decided they wanted to do the deal. And again, easy for me to say, as somebody who's unelected, that looks at the region and says, okay, well, that would make sense. If I put a hat on. I, so I'm a St. Albert resident. If I said, well, but what if St. Albert came up with the fastest or the, you know, maybe that would be competitive and, and better against its regional peers, but that may not necessarily be in the best interest of the investor or quite frankly, the other stakeholders, because again, we're creating this internal competition. So one of the benefits of having folks like myself who, uh, again, are there in, in an independent fa fashion is we can sort of give that direction to Malcolm, who can then help work that through all of our various um, opportunities and, and with the various stakeholders that we interact with. Excellent. Councillor Noyan, question? Yeah, thank you, and thank you for being here this afternoon, gentlemen. Um, you're obviously doing a great job of diversifying economic attraction to the region. Often we're, we're known for oil gas industry, you know, maybe globally or nationally. Uh, would, would you say, and I think it alludes to the screen, and you've touched on it a little bit, but... Um, are, are, you, are you targeting any sectors individually here in, in the short term as, as opposed to others? Maybe you, you talked about AI and tech and how that's a rapidly changing uh, stream at the moment. Um, it could be difficult to keep on top of. But, yeah, do, do we have some, some up and coming sectors that to keep an eye on just, you know, as, as counsel and, and the, the background kind of thing that you're really targeting? Yeah. So, I mean, the one, so let me go through the list here. I mean, we've just had a major health sciences, um, announcement with, with the, um, uh, help me Malcolm, what's it called again? <laughs> I can't remember the name. The Canadian Critical Drug Initiative. Right. So CCDI. That's game changing, right? In terms of what that's going to mean for the region, in terms of life sciences, the ability to produce small molecules, all that sort of thing. And, you know, we've got Gilead that's here. So we've now got sort of anchor tenants, major investment that can catalyze that. Um, hydrogen is a major opportunity that the organization is focused on. We talk about it at every board meeting. We've got, you know, significant momentum. And again, in concert with the other stakeholders and partners that we're working with, that's a key piece. Global logistics and supply chain, there is some significant stuff happening. As I mentioned, uh, hopefully we're going to be able to, you know, in the coming year here, announce some of what's on, what's in the works, but it is game game changing. And if and when that happens, the spinoffs in terms of what that will mean for the region, I, I don't think we even kind of can comprehend what that's going to look like if we can pull off some of what's in the pipeline. The food, I would say, you know, the two on here where, where I think we've got some, you know, tougher uh, ground to till here, pun intended, is food and agriculture. It's a tough one. 
Um, the value added piece can be difficult and challenging. And, you know, we've got, so P, P processing, you know, or, or um, uh, uh, plant protein, that's a, that is a tough nut to crack. And I mean, we've had organizations that have been funded publicly that, you know, have not been able to retain funding and things like that. So we've also got some climate challenges between this region and, and down south. And, and so that's a whole other thing that we've got to get our head around. And then the whole AI and tech piece, as enabling as it can be and as it is, again, I think we've got to look at um, what's happening in other places and what's our niche and how do we kind of carve out a bit of a specific niche because that's something that we haven't yet done that's my that's my view so good progress on all of those um we're leaning in i mean in some in some ways it's deliberate and you go and target but we're also you know i mean if something comes in inbound that looks exciting we obviously we deal with that right but um these are the focus sectors there is deliberate strategy against each one and I would say we're making progress, but again, the progress on some is is moving more smoothly and quickly than it is on some others. Let's say, of course, and that's that's going to be the way it is, and under, understandable. No, thank you for the overview of that. No, yeah. sure. Great. So that looks like all the questions. So thank you very much for coming out. I look forward to the AGM on Thursday, and this was very informative. Um, you're free to stay. You're free to leave. I know you have very busy schedules, so, but I uh, greatly appreciate having you come out to Fort Saskatchewan today. So thank thank you. you. Okay, we're going to move right along to our designated industrial assessment update, Shannon Andruco, and I'll have you introduce uh, anybody who's participating with you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Shannon Andruco, Manager of Budget and Financial Planning. Joining me here today is Grace Zhao, Assessment Advisor, Arla Pertl, Manager of Major Plants, and joining us virtually is Janet Hayes, Linear Coordinator, all from the Municipal Assessment and Grants Division of Municipal Affairs. They will provide an update on the city's designated industrial assessment and answer any questions you may have. With that, I'll turn it over to Grace. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking the time today to listen to our presentation on the designated industrial property assessment process, and more specifically, how it affects the provincial assessment role in your municipality. I'm Grace Zhang. Um, there's a, a typo on my designation. I'm a PNG and a MBA. With me today is Arla Porto, the manager of major plants. We will start out this presentation by explaining who we are. We will give a breakdown of the annual operational cycle of the Provincial Assessor's Office. We will point out important dates and timelines. We will talk about what the requisition rate is and that timeline. We will explain the type of property described as designated industrial property. We will further talk about CDL Fort Saskatchewan's inventory and how it compares to its assessed value. We will also share other relevant update on DI property assessment in Alberta that your municipality just need to be aware of. This presentation will take 10 to 15 minutes, leaving us some time for questions. Who we are? Where are you designated industrial property assessment team working on behalf of the provincial assessor? This team prepare, amend, and defend provincial assessment role, which allows municipality to tax DI properties. We are a multidisciplinary team of professionals with diverse skills, ranging in property assessment, engineering, accounting, geospatial and data analytics, project management, quality assurance, and with advanced computer administrative com capabilities. 
this is our organization chart. Within the provincial assessor's office, the leadership consists of Victoria Batchman as our executive director for the assessment services branch. We also have Mike Menard of SEPA, and he's also a provincial assessor. And Mike Turgeon as the director of linear and data management team. Other managers listed here help oversee the day-to-day -day operations and efficient running of the bench. It is important to know that the leadership team is always available to offer necessary clarifications regarding the assessment role issued for your municipality. The assessment service branch prepared the provincial assessment role and once completed, sent it out to the respective municipalities in Alberta. Individual notices are equally issued to the DI property owners. Thereafter, parties are allowed to make, inc to make inquiries that we respond to. If the inquiries are not addressed to the satisfaction of the property owners, they have the right to file a complaint. We define and amend assessment as required. Then the cycle begins again with property inspections, collections, and analysis of reported data for the next assessment year. This is very simplified, as there are many cogs in the wheel. Maintaining confidence of the stakeholders, providing stability and consistency of the assessment role, and continuously improve on accuracy, transparency, efficiencies, and communications our day-to-day -day operations. Necessary timelines to be noticed are also captured here. Though indicative are to be confirmed later. One thing I would like to mention is um, for the industrial assessment, amendment number one assessment notice that's going to be issued on May 12th, there's going to be about $5.6 million increase uh, for Dow's cracking furnace project that's commissioned last year. The increase is uh, because of um, the, 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 the claim that uh, Dow previous um, submitted based the, for some excluded cost. Um, they were not able to provide enough documents, so um, they agreed to withdraw those, uh, those claims. DI property requisition timeline. The requisition rate is based on the provincial assessor's role and the amount required to operate centralized industrial property assessment. In March each year, a ministerial order is prepared and approved by the minister. This order is sent to all CAOs with the updated requisition rate. In April, the municipal affairs website is updated with a new rate and municipalities with designated industrial properties were applied the requisition rate to the eligible properties. The requisition is then collected on behalf of the municipal affairs and payment is remitted to the government of Alberta within 30 days of the municipal tax due date. In February of the following year, a tax requisition reconciliation is calculated and sent to CAOs allowing for any unpaid balance to be reflected in the upcoming year. There are two types of properties included in the uh, provincial assessment role. The first is the, the linear properties, and this consists of properties that is open across cl uh, jurisdictions throughout Alberta. So this includes pipelines, wells, telecoms, cable, distrib cable distribution, electrical power system, electrical power generation, and railway. It is important to state that leader property has always been assessed by the assessment services branch. The next one is the industrial properties. So industrial properties include all facilities regulated by Alberta Energy Regulator, Alberta Utility Commission, and a Canadian Energy Regulator. This includes well sites, batteries, compressor stations, Major plans are also listed in the Machine and Equipment Assessment Minister's guideline and include oil sands, gas plants, pipeline terminals, pulp and paper mills, sawmills, refineries, and petrochemical plants. 
These properties are now included in the centralized industrial property assessment system managed by the assessment services branch. In total, your municipality contributed to about $1.9 billion in assessment to the provincial role. There is an increase of the $267 million from last year. This comprises of 17% of a change in the industrial, DI, uh, industrial properties and about 7.3% of increase from the linear property. The inventory in the city of Fort Saskatchewan is comprised most of uh, petrochemical and chemical plants, gas plants, metal, uh, metal refining facilities, wells and pipelines. So this is a chart to represent the assessment role for um, all DI properties in the entire province. The 2020 assessment year to the 2021 assessment year, or the 2021 assessment year to the 2022 uh, uh, sorry, or the 2021 tax year to the 2022 tax year, witnessed a, a rather steady assessment of DI properties with a total assessment of the pro provincial role at around uh, $171 billion. However, uh, the 2022 AY or 2023 TY has been a significant leap, a monetary increase of 6.5% or around $184 billion in DI property assessment in Alberta. Twenty twenty three tax year, here are some key updates. Tax holidays. In, in October 2020, the minister at the time made an announcement that there was to be no assessment on new wells and pipe assets for the next two years. So this means no tax was to be collected on new wells drilled on pipeline laid for the 2021 AY, 2022 AY, and 2023 AY. These tax holidays were expired this year, the 2023 AY. In your municipality, there was no new well drilled, but some pipelines was laid with an assessment cumulative value of $939,530. This amount and records of any new pipelines or wells in subsequent years will be reported to you annually, so you can make a better prediction for tax purposes in the 2025 tax year and beyond. Assessment Model Review Update. A little history on assessment model review. In, in 2019, Municipal Affairs launched an assessment model review to update the models used to assess, to, used to assess wells pipelines, and well site machine equipment. The potential impact with this proposed update creates significant stakeholder concerns, and the review was put on hold. Now, the government is committed to developing a long-term review plan. This plan is being considered at this time. Assessment year modifiers update. Municipalities are encouraged to check the Municipal Affairs website for details of the current AYMs when making computations for tax purposes of eligible DI properties within your jurisdictions. Our branch is always excited about any opportunity to engage with the stakeholders. In this instance, the city of Fort Saskatchewan. And we were happy to accept this opportunity to present to you today. We recognize the importance of the work we do and know we need to work with our stakeholders toward achieving our, our, goal, our, our goal of fair and equitable assessment, and of course, a stable assessment base for your municipality. We also hope to collaborate with municipalities and have a good exchange of information to support each other. We will continue to support your, munis your municipality on all DI property assessment matters and welcome you to reach out to, um, to our team at any time. So with that, I thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Great. Thank you very much for that presentation. So we will go into some questions. Councillor Harris, you're first. Um, thanks. Uh, very informative, and uh, I've been around this business for a long time, and so this, this has changed quite a bit in the time I've been doing it. 
But under our normal assessment and taxation process for residential and non-residential properties, our assessor prepares the assessment. Ultimately, the property owner has the ability to appeal that assessment through the appropriate appeal process. How do owners of designated industrial properties have the opportunity to appeal the assessment that ultimately is produced by the province relative to their land holdings and their production capability and all the things that are on schedules that you ultimately assess? How, how does that work? So Dow, for example, if, if they're not happy with the way the schedules have been prepared and the way the numbers are rolling out, how do they handle that? Because they don't come to us. Correct. That's a very good question. And in fact, it's done the exact same way. So if they feel that um, the assessment isn't valued accurately or fairly or, or there's an error, they may complain, file a complaint just the same way as a homeowner would. So it's to the Land and Rights Property Tribunal that they would file the complaint with, and we would be responsible to defend that assessment. Okay, so the information that you gather comes from the companies to prepare their assessment ultimately. So they're providing you with construction costs and depreciation, and you're working with depreciation schedules and stuff of that sort of stuff. So ultimately, is it more of a kind of a teamwork approach where you're preparing something that ultimately doesn't need to be assessed? Or uh, appealed from that standpoint, if they're not happy with it. Well, I would agree with you that uh, that they're if they're reporting everything an absolute, then there isn't very much room. But there are some gray areas in our regulated assessment process, and that is what they may file a complaint on. Okay, good. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thanks. Just a follow-up question to that. So, given that there is. Uh, was it 16 percent, I think, on average uh, increase in property tax assessment for DIs this year? Uh, ha have you received any appeals for 2023 or no? At this no point, one? no, we have not received any. I just asked that question today. The last day to file a complaint is May 8th. However, we have not received anything at this time. We will communicate with the municipality if we do, and we'll supply the risk amount that uh, they are filing the complaint regarding. Excellent. That just shows that you're doing your job very well. So. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the only question that I have is when you're talking about new development, whether it's pipelines or wells, so do you get your information just basically from permits that have been submitted? Like how do you get your information or do you physically go out and uh, observe where where these wells or pipelines are taking place or go on to the uh, industrial areas? Thank you. That's a very good question. Um, first off, Getting a permit really does help. It gives us an insight that we need to be prepared and we make that initial contact with the property owners in order to uh, work with them as we go along with the project. Uh, Dow is a prime example of, of our uh, relationship that we've built with them since taking over uh, Fort Saskatchewan. And at that time we did an in a formal meeting at their site and went through what is required and what we needed as um, for them to report to us. And then we did a whole site inspection just to uh, catch up onto what that property is involving. Plus there was some new improvements added at Dow. So we wanted to be with them while they were um, calculating those costs and reporting them back to us. Okay, thank you. And then the second question that I have is on the linear assessment. I know at one point in time, the government had talked about having a uh, across the board amount that was for the linear assessment. So whether you were in Fort Saskatchewan or Strathcona or, or Two Hills or wherever you were. So how does that work? Or does everybody still get to uh, levy their own fee? At this point, <clears throat> sorry, at this point, they still get to levy their own fee. I'm not aware of any talk about um, uh, pooling that resource, if you will. There hasn't, that hasn't been brought up. I know I've got Janet on the line, so if she wants to explain more on that, she can. But as far as I'm, I understand that hasn't been part of the conversations. Okay, and I only ask that because I know there was conversations amongst um, a group of mayors at one point in time saying, oh, we're, you know, some are going to be penalized where, you know, because they were charging more and others weren't. So that's why I was asking that. Um, did uh, Janet want to weigh in on anything? Yeah, you have that right, Arla, what you were stating there. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment about the wells and pipelines that are done in Alberta. And uh, we do use the Alberta Energy Regulators information. Um, 
as of October 31st, we do a download of all the information and all the pipelines and wells are assessed uh, according to that data. There will be uh, the odd pipeline that Arlo was mentioning that are at some of the plant sites there that would not be included in with the linear and uh, would be included in with the plant and reported. Um, that's all I have to comment on right now. Okay, and just a follow-up question to that. So I know with residential, there's supplemental. So if something's not finished yet, so do you have supplemental or, or do you just have to wait till uh, each project is finished? Uh, we do have supplementary assessments uh, within the municipalities that have the taxing bylaws. And if it's done by October 31st of that taxation year, then uh, if it's completed by that date, then we will put on a supplementary assessment to that municipality. Okay, thank you very much, Janet. Nice to see you on online. All right, are there any additional questions? Doesn't appear there's any additional questions. So thank you for coming out to Fort Saskatchewan and shedding some light on the industrial assessment. Um, I know it was a big change for us, but uh, it appears though it's going well. Ms. Andruko, you're not having any issues or concerns? No, we're not at this time. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And again, you're welcome to stay, but you're also um, uh, free to leave. Okay, thank you very much for our time. Thank you. All right, we're going to do the next one, and after the next one, then we'll take a break. So uh, we are going to move on to the Fort Saskatchewan Policing Committee. And we have Stuart Begg and Kareen Ryder. Uh, Rainer. Make your rider today. Sorry. Good afternoon, Your Worship and members of council. My name is Corrine Rayner and I am the Director of Protective Services for the City. With me I have the chair of our policing committee, Stuart Begg. Stuart and I are here to present to you with a year-end report, our, our yearly reporting from the Policing Committee to Council. Um, we are also here to, um, for the Policing Committee to show support in um, relation to the RCMP's annual policing priorities that will be coming forward to Council um, on May the 9th. The policing committee is made up of one member of council, so we have Councillor Macon as our council representative, and six members of the public. Stuart Begg is our chair, Heather Boonstra is the vice chair, Stephen Hall is the public complaints director, Gloria Braithwaite is the Alberta Association of Police Governance representative on the committee. She also sits on the Alberta Police Advisory Committee. Mardarsh Kapsu and Kabir Rendawar are voting members of the committee. The committee also welcomed a member of the youth, um, Xander Prodanovic, um, has joined our committee. He's a non-voting member, but he does attend all the meetings and he does help provide that youth perspective, Adam, when we're discussing issues. The purpose of the policing committee, it is the link between city council the RCMP, and the residents of Fort Saskatchewan. The committee helps understand the needs, values, expectations of the community when it comes to public safety and policing concerns. And Mr. Begg will be sharing with you how they do that throughout the year um, with their mandate of uh, providing and being a, a committee of council. The policing committee bylaw sets out the roles and responsibilities of the committee and are set by council. The policing committee can assist council with any public safety concerns or issues relating to policing in Fort Saskatchewan. The committee would like to update the policing committee bylaw by changing the composition of the committee. 
Section 4 of the bylaw states that a committee shall consist of a maximum of seven voting members. And the committee would like to bring forward um, later in the year, year an update to this to change that to nine voting members and having one of those members be uh, a person under the age of 18 so that they, we can have a voting member um, of the youth representing the, on the policing committee. So I'll be bringing those updates um, forward in probably September at a regular council meeting um, for your approval. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Begg for the remainder of the presentation. Thank you, Corrine, and thank you, uh, Council, for uh, allowing us to come here today. Uh, I want to uh, just uh, go over a few things that uh, we are doing as a group uh, on the Policing Committee Oversight. Uh, we do meet nine times uh, during the year, and depending if there's an emergent situation, we will meet uh, more than the nine times in the year. Uh, we meet also with the Detachment Commander, uh, Inspector LaRock, and uh, we go over crime stats, we do his staffing issues, we would look at the emerging issues that uh, pertain to our community. Uh, we also look at the traffic stats and, and uh, we have a good discussion in regards to any concerns that the policing or the community would have. We also have our quarterly annual uh, policing report that we review. We have our annual policing priority consultation with the detachment commander and his staff. We look at the traffic safety uh, working group, of which I'm a, also a member of that particular group. And uh, we participate in many uh, community events uh, to date. The accomplishments that we've uh, covered so far in uh, 2022, we've, uh, as uh, Karina had mentioned, we also have a, a young lad by the name of Xander working with us. Uh, although he's non-voting, he does have good input and he has an insight about the youth in the community, which I feel is extremely, extremely important. Um, we also have uh, many public engagements. We, we, we were involved with the uh, municipal uh, enforcement in regards to the bicycle safety program and uh, the Fort Saskatchewan Indigenous Society attending their meetings also. Uh, we have also involved with the training uh, sessions by the Alberta Public Safety and Emergency Services on Policing Oversight. Uh, we uh, also are involved with the, uh, uh, we're also, we have one sitting member on the Alberta Police Advisory Committee, and we're, I myself, I'm involved with the Traffic Safety Working Group. So we are uh, kind of thin whenever it comes to all of our, uh, our responsibilities. In regards to our, uh, the Corrine, this is where you take over now. So the, the, oh. Sorry. Policing committee is made up of, um, they, they ha we have a, sorry, a public complaints director that sits on the committee. Um, and his name is Stephen Hall. There were, there were no complaints received through the public complaints director over the past year in 2022 in regards to policing services or officer complaints. There are many different avenues in which those complaints um, can be reported throughout Alberta. And so the, many of those types of complaints come straight through the detachment and into the inspector, the officer in charge, and he will typically deal with those complaints informally. They will get resolved informally. Um, there is a more formal route that people can use is the, the Canadian Review and Complaints Commission. This is where more serious types of complaints against officer conduct or service levels can come through, and they are dealt with, again, back down to the officer in charge who deals with those, and that CRCC um, the, the Canadian Review and Complaints Commission has that oversight into those types of investigations and there is a, an appeal process. So we don't find that we get a lot of complaints regarding um, officers when you consider our, our total um, detachment file count. That's something that Inspector LaRock will probably speak to you when he comes to speak to council. Um, so that's just the many different avenues um, we do find that through our social media posts, our meetings are open to the public. Um, if anyone does have a concern, they can email the policing committee directly, and then that will be forwarded on to, to the inspector um, to deal with those types of complaints. 
we do have a very good working relationship and the public complaints director is that liaison with the officer in charge and the committee. So they, they will be in communication if anything does come up. One other item that we uh, are quite involved with is that we have a community services award that uh, we started uh, two years ago, and this will be our third year of uh, presenting this award. And as you can see on the slide, we have Constable uh, Mowbray, who is our school resource officer, who was awarded that. That's for any one of the members of the municipal police force or the RCMP or the staff who go beyond uh, what is expected of them in regards to their role in policing in Fort Saskatchewan. We uh, are presently have a meeting sometime this week, Thursday this week, and uh, we will be setting up a date sometime in May. And what we do is we host a barbecue for the members of the detachment. And uh, at that particular time, we will do an award to the next uh, recipient. So what our priorities are for uh, 2023, and uh, they are, we have quite a list, as you can see. We're involved with the trade show, which is coming up here in the next month or so. Uh, we also involved with the uh, committee bylaw update, uh, community engagement. We're always looking for different groups within our community who uh, want to either come to us and give us a presentation, or we will attend their different events that we're invited to. We assist in the municipal police force uh, with their bicycle rodeo, which is going to be on June the 4th at the Terrace Field. Uh, we were involved with that last year, and again, we, we had a good turnout, but we want more kids to be showing up. And uh, we're also involved with the youth involvement on the committee whenever we have uh, Xander working with us. Uh, he's a great asset, and we want more involvement from the, from the young lads. Uh, we also, uh, we, what we want to do is we want to enhance the profile of the police committee. And we try that in many different ways, whether it be through the media or on the radio or through the paper itself, or just personal contact with the public uh, themselves. So we are making advances, but uh, I just find it's a little slow. And uh, the problem we have is uh, lots of work, but lack of people, because uh, I'm the one who's retired. Everybody else is still working. So the, uh, the RCMP have their 2023-24 uh, uh, policing priorities. And as you can see, traffic safety, municipal, uh, or police community relations and the property theft. And I uh, advised or, or I consulted with our group and we're uh, unanimous in regards to that, uh, those particular priorities. So we do uh, support Inspector um, LaRock in regards to what the priorities are for the detachment in this area. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. I'll open it up to questions, Councillor Harris. Um, interesting. Uh, so we have a contract with, obviously, the Government of Canada to provide police services through a contract with the RCMP. Um, is a police committee a voluntary thing? in relation to how our council administers and works with the police to deliver those services. Uh, I, I, I realize that in a municipal policing context, like in the city of Edmonton, they are required to have a police commission. And the police commission in Edmonton is obviously going through a number of changes as they recently uh, decided yesterday. But in the context of having a police committee providing, I guess, uh, contact with the community, is, is it a voluntary thing? Your Worship, through to Councillor Harris, you're correct. So it is a committee of council made up of volunteers in the community besides um, the council representative that, that is on the committee. Right. So, so we've got the opportunity to create the way that that committee interfaces and advises council on priorities that we should be mindful of. And so, in essence, what you're doing today is helping us understand where we need to be going in the future with the pr presentation of your priorities. Is that correct? Your Worship, through to Councillor Harris, that is correct. That is the function of your policing committee, Good. is to help council make those informed decisions and to provide you with information as far as our relationship with our, our, our current um, contractor with the RCMP. And um, they will 
help and assist counsel in making those decisions. Would you suggest, and just one last question, would you suggest that the, the activities of police committee are more robust today than they were 10 years ago? Because we've had a police committee for many, many years. Your Worship, through to Councillor Harris, I would say that, yes, our, our committee is, has evolved significantly in the last several years in getting more involved and getting more in alignment with what their role is for you as council and to bringing back in that information is important in the community. So it's not just to sit there and listen to reports. We're really, we're really encouraging the committee um, to be bringing back that feedback from the community um, back in through to the inspector to say this is what we're hearing in the community. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. So the only question that I really have is when you're talking about complaints, um, the policing committee doesn't get involved with the HR side of what's going on, uh, correct? Through to your worship, that is correct. It is just an avenue where the community can bring a concern um, through, through to the policing committee. The process is that the committee then forwards it on to the inspector of the detachment. So that's why we often don't find a lot of engagement with that because typically people just bring their concern right through to the inspector or they go through the other formal process through the RCMP, through that CRCC. Um, but it just is, it provides another avenue for council to use as well um, in, in bringing forward concerns and then they get dealt with and then there's that follow-up. Um, to ensure that the inspector has followed through on that concern. Okay, and I guess I only ask that question because, you know, there's different lines of confidentiality and, and uh, that's probably my concern on that. So I want to go to Mr. Big. So talk about traffic safety. What are the biggest issues on traffic safety now that we've got the Walmart corner resolved? <laughs> <laughs> you think you have. <laughs> okay, talk to us about traffic safety. I, I think the biggest problem we have is is the that intersection at the, the Walmart corner, of course, uh, with the, the number of upgradings that's going on with the, within our own community Community, the traffic is tremendous and uh, until say the companies themselves start staggering their hours we're going to have hundreds of thousands of vehicles through our uh, community going right through on the uh, veterans way and and that is always a problem people are always in a hurry uh, they're tired at the end of the day they want to get home they're not paying attention and most of our accidents are dealing with rear enders as compared to uh, primarily the intersections our, our stats are actually here for the millions and millions of vehicles that we have is quite good, but to have one fatal accident is, is not good at all. So we can't do much unless we had a bypass uh, through Fort Saskatchewan, in my opinion, uh, to lower the traffic. But of course now with the bridge and we have four lanes, we're gonna have more and more traffic coming from all routes. And of course now also whenever people are leaving the communities or leaving the industries on the on the east side of Fort Saskatchewan, they're taking the side streets, they're taking the back roads and so on. So that certainly creates a lot of confusion, a lot of congestion in regards to traffic and people maybe out walking or driving their bicycles and so on. So that's the biggest issue I see is the, the traffic. We can't stop that. Uh, the only thing we do is perhaps build a bypass or or reroute traffic somehow or stagger their hours so we don't have that kind of traffic. Okay, thank you. Councillor Noyan? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question just had to do with, uh, I guess, c complaints and feedback you got, so community interactions are great to see that we have no, no complaints, but people can also maybe... Uh, you know, complain about something that's going on. If it, uh, maybe complain is the right word, but say if there's some petty theft in their neighborhood and that that's been reoccurring, and they are they encouraged to uh, to, to like to contact the policing committee and then funnel that uh, through the committee as an entity, or is that something that's more encouraged directly to go to bylaw or the RCMP? Through your worship to Councillor Noyan, we do advertise that as you can attend a policing committee meeting to bring forward um, any types of public safety concerns that you may have. So an example of that is we did have a group a few years ago bring forward traffic safety concerns. Um, and they were concerned about their neighborhood and that was brought forward to the policing committee to help them um, come up with different types of solutions. So we do encourage that and we, o that we open up those um, 
our meetings to the public and bring forward any type of public safety concern or policing question or concern can be forwarded through to the policing committee. Right, okay, and then how much contact have you had from uh, from residents in Fort Saskatchewan over the past year? That doesn't have to be a you know, quantifiable number, but are you getting getting calls every day or one or two a week, would you say? Or? Uh, your, through your worship to Councillor Noyan, we, we find we don't get a lot of input and people attending the policing committee meetings, even though they are advertised. Um, you look at even our town hall that we recently had, we had about 40 people attend the, the policing town hall. So um, we, don't, we don't find we get a lot of that engagement from the community. Okay, so maybe just visibility is is something to to, to work on, I guess, and sp spread the word kind of thing for for the the actual the, the purpose, the mandate of, of the committee. All right, thank you. Okay, if thanks. I could uh, just add to that, a lot of uh, occasions because of my involvement in the community, people will come to me with situations and so on, which are, in my opinion, somewhat petty, but they don't know what the answer is. So I have the, the background where I can resolve a lot of issues. If I feel that it's something that's serious enough, then I will bring it forward to our, to our group, to Steve, to the inspector. But a lot of the issues are quick, very quickly resolved. If there's a bark, barking dog and so on, what should I do? Things like that. So uh, I do have an awful lot of contact with the public. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris, we'll come back to you. Uh, Mr. Begg, picking up on a line of question that the mayor brought up relative to the flow through of traffic on our major highways, 15 and 21. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you may choose not to respond to this question, but I'm going to ask you a pointed question. Uh, we just had a long discussion about uh, the need to widen Highway 15 and 21, and it's a project that's in our capital project. But Council, in its infinite wisdom, decided to delay the widening of a section of Highway 15 from the 1521 intersection to uh, 101st Street. Do you think that makes sense? Do you think that widening the highway, respecting the fact that driver high, uh, behavior is a difficult thing to, to deal with and to control, but do you think that it makes sense that we have a plan that looks at the phased improvement of the highway through our intersection or through our community on a phased basis going forward? Does it make sense to you? <laughs> Well, that's kind of a loaded question. Totally. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to look in the crystal ball to see what's going to happen in a year or two years or three years from now. And uh, decisions are made based on what's taking place and what the, the projects are that are coming up, and primarily in the, in the, in the industrial area. Uh, that's a real loaded question that I don't have enough knowledge or consultation with to be able to give you a, a, what I feel would be a good answer or a positive answer. The council in their infinite wisdom has taken individual positions and we've reached a collective decision to kill the project, at least for now. And I think we have to respect the council decision in that regard. However, if we look at it from the standpoint of you are a community representative, the other members of the police committee and our local constabulary are members of our community. So, you know, as an elected official, I'm looking at trying to get feedback in relation to whether that's a valuable project that has been recommended by administration as something that we should be considering, but then ultimately we're making a different political decision going forward. So it's more of a rhetorical question in that context because it's something that I think is important going forward. And you as a member of the community, I was curious what you might think about it. So. That's all. No, I, I appreciate the question. Uh, I guess the question back to you is when is the right time? Who knows? And that, and that is the question. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, that appears to be all the uh, questions. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you for coming uh, out this afternoon and uh, providing us with some great information. And to Inspector LaRock for uh, being here in the back and somebody else beside him. So thank you. He has Staff Sergeant Terry Hagen is with him as well. So Terry and I will be coming forward to Council on May the 9th to present the annual policing priorities. All right. Thank you very much. We look forward to that. Uh, does Council want to push on or do you want a 10 minute break? Pardon? Break? Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break. So it's 3.33, so 3.43.
Just testing my mic here. Can you hear me, Barry? I don't hear you. You're on mute. Uh, yeah, I can hear you, Dan. Yeah. I think we're supposed to be on mute. I don't know if the whole council chambers can hear us, but I'm going to mute myself now. All right, we're uh, ready to uh, reconvene from the recess. So our next item is Annexation Area Service Servicing Studies, Joey Farbrother and Grant Schaefer presenting. Welcome. Okay, good afternoon, uh, Mayor and Council. I'm Joey Farbrother, Senior Engineering Coordinator. I'm joined today by Grant Schaefer, Director of Fleet Facilities and Engineering. Um, also by Dan Ziegler, Transportation Project Manager with ISL Engineering, and Barry Raynard, Lead of Water Planning, also with I ISL Engineering. Dan and Barry are both joining us virtually today. I'm here today to present the servicing design brief for the Annex Lands. So on January 1st, 2020, the city annexed 252 acres of land from Strathcona County. In the 2021 and 2022 budget, Council approved funding for the annexation servicing studies, development of annexation area servicing plans and levy plans to prepare lands for future use was a strategic initiative in the 2023 to 2026 strategic plan. So the servicing studies provide a framework for future development in the annexation area. The report will be used to develop area structure plans, neighborhood structure plans, offsite levies, and future detailed engineering studies. The report studied four key services, transportation, water, wastewater, and stormwater. An open house was held for landowners in the annexation area on November 2nd, 2022. 
Letters were sent to 61 landowners, of which approximately 30 people attended the open house, with another four people requesting information regarding the open house. So transportation, the scope of the study for transportation was to determine arterial and collector roads in the annexation area and how these roads will connect to the city's existing road network. The study used a modified grid pattern for the road network, which was a recommendation in the municipal development plan. Alignments for local roads will be finalized with the development of ASPs and NSPs. We also looked at the road network in the two undeveloped quarter sections in South Fort in order to better connect the annexed lands with the planned road network in South Fort. The road network in those quarter sections were altered an amendment to the South Fort ASP will be required. The developer, developer of these quarter sections was consulted regarding the change. Two additional all directional intersections will be required to service the annexation area. These intersections are spaced out at 800 meters. The study also identified two right in right outs along Highway 21. Um, and then 92nd Street, so Range Road 225, is shown as a complete street arterial road in the annexation area. This will allow the road to continue as a greenway, but will also upgrade the road for vehicle traffic. This will help with uh, connectivity as the area builds out. A further study is recommended to determine the final cross section. Stormwater. Uh, for stormwater, the annexation lands are designed to drain through a series of storm ponds that are connected by pipes. The lands west of Highway 21 drain to Point of Pins Creek, while the lands east of Highway 21 drain to Ross Creek. There's an existing man-made ditch in the lands east of Highway 21 called Yorkville Ditch. This ditch picks up drainage from the annex lands, but also connects um, a larger basin that extends into Strathcona County. The ditch is proposed to move along the south boundary and then along the pipeline corridor that runs along the city's east boundary. Relocating the ditch would help create more of a contiguous development pattern in the annex lands and a greenway along the pipeline corridor. At the start of the project, ISL reached out to the province to determine if any existing wetlands in the annex lands would be claimed by the province. ISL identified seven wetlands and the province indicated that only one of the seven would be claimed by the Crown. This is wetland number one on the map. Um, the water distribution system in the annex lands was designed in conjunction with the city's existing water distribution system. We looked at expanding the two existing reservoirs, but the study determined that the most um, cost-effective and efficient way to service the annexed area would be to create um, a new, or to construct a new water reservoir in the annexed area. The study also looked at interim servicing options. Uh, possible connection points were identified in the report. The study determined that additional storage capacity will be required when the city reaches a population between 35,000 and 40,000. So wastewater, the city's existing wastewater flows to a siphon located by the Lions Campground. Um, it crosses the river to a pump station and then flows to the wastewater treatment plant located by Legends Golf Course. The study looked at several options to service the annex lands. The most cost, of, cost effective option was to flow the wastewater to the existing siphon. During the study, the city and ISL met with the Alberta Capital Region Wastewater Commission. The commission indicated that its preference was not to use the existing siphon and pipes that ran under the river. Um, we provided the commission with our analysis of alternate routes and the cost associated with those alignments. Although it is not the commission's pre preference, the alternate routes were not feasible and the commission has an obligation to service the city from the existing siphon. Further discussions with the commission will be required to discuss the implications of servicing the annex lands through the existing siphon. Uh, the report also looked at temporary service options as the ultimate wastewater pipes will take several years and significant development to construct. Uh, so the report recommends numerous items that have cost implications. Uh, these are develop off-site levies in preparation of development in the annexed area, update existing levies to include additional storage re required in the pre-annexed area, um, update the traffic bylaw to extend the tra truck route along Veterans Way to the south boundary, reach out to utility companies with infrastructure along 101 Street, um, and finalize the cross-section based on those discussions with utility companies, Complete a planning study for 92nd Street. Uh, complete a functional planning study of Veterans Way from West Park Drive to the south boundary. And complete a Ross Creek uh, Basin study to investigate erosion risk, which may impact release rates to the creek. No cost estimates were developed for these items. 
Um, the servicing study um, did have a budget surplus of 70,000. That surplus is being proposed to uh, fund the offsite levies. So our next steps would be to update bylaw C1417 offsite levy bylaw, um, update the South Fort ASP with those road network changes, and then um, developers can continue on preparing ASPs and NSPs when they are um, ready to develop in the annex area. So that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Councillor Macon, you're first. Lots of questions. I'm the only one on there right now. I'm next. <laughs> um, thanks for your presentation. Um, the only question that I had, and I apologize, apologize if I missed this, what was the um, issue with the Wastewater Commission with going through the same line? What was the actual objection? Sure. They Mainly they're just um, the risk of crossing the river, right? So having those those pipes underneath the river was their main objection, I guess, at that location. Also, capacity issues. They, they currently have two pipes that run underneath there, but they only want to use capacity in one just to have that redundance in case anything um, ever happens with that one pipe. So essentially, they think, believe it's an increased risk with the increased flow? Increased flow and just the inherited risk with, you know, going underneath the river where if you went south, you wouldn't be making that crossing. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the question that I had when I look at that drawing that you have with the road pathways on it, and you talk about updating area structure plans. So Landrex is going to bring us an area structure plan back. How do these uh, overlap with one another? Like their area structure plan, uh, this servicing thing, and then the South Ford area structure plan? How, do, how does that all go together? I, help me understand that. Sure. So the, there's existing area structure plans in West Park and South Fort. Um, what Landrex is doing is they'll create a new area structure plan for the area that they're proposing to, do, to, to develop. Um, the amendments for the road network are to the South Fort area structure plan. So it's those two undeveloped quarter sections which um, are owned by a different developer is what would be um, revised. Because I'm seeing the grid on the on the point of pin side too. So not, and and that's not contained within an area structure plan right now. That's where I'm trying to Oh so I think I understand. But like so this provides a framework for those area structure plans that Landrex will be doing. So this is providing their arterial and collector roads in that area that Landrex right now is looking at developing. And then there will be further refinement with those ASPs to develop local roads and and um, continue okay. on with those arterial and collector roads that are identified in this report. Okay. And uh, wetlands one and two, how many hectares do those take up? Like how much land, what's the land mass on those? I don't have that offhand. It, it, <laughs> they look fairly big on the map, and that's why I'm asking that. So I'll go to... Uh, um, Smith, uh, Smith. So when we were doing the annexation, was that all taken into consideration? How much what the land mass was? Uh, to your worship, yes. Um, existing wetlands was considered when we uh, did the annexation calculations. Okay. Okay, that's fine. I'd, as long as it was considered when we were doing the annexation, I'm fine with that. Thank you, Councillor Blizzard. You're next. Thanks for your presentation and thanks for keeping it shorter than the 170 page document that we were given. Um, I do have a couple of things. So the wastewater going all towards the Lions campground kind of seems counterintuitive when the whole city is below there and Legends is down below that. Is it just because we have to put new pipes in the ground that that's expensive? Like to me long term that still seems like it would make sense. So through your worship of Councillor Blizzard. Yeah, so it, it's mainly because of the new pipes that have to, to go south. 
um, and the fact that some of them have to be like you'd have to incorporate lift stations into the annexed area um, and some of it there was a few different options but you couldn't run it by well you could run it by gravity but that was even more expensive or you're doing it between um, force mains and and gravity mm -hmm. so it was just the cost of of that new pipes where we could utilize existing infrastructure that's already in place. I get that with the cost. I just wonder if, you know, as the city expands, it seems to be expanding more that way. If maybe long term, that would be a better option. Just once the pipes are there, then they're in place for future growth. Right. So through your worship to Councillor Blizzard, I think with those costs, the consideration that we took into account was it could stifle Appreciate. development oh, okay. because you're putting oh, those costs the cost. on okay. the annexation areas and, and their okay. lives. And the, the biggest thing that I was looking at here was the change. And I saw the explanation was, you know, traffic safety. The roads are going back to more of a grid of the old style of north and south, east, west, however you want to call the directions, but as opposed to current subdivisions that are looped. And I remember when they, you know, started doing subdivisions because I grew up in a grid area and cars speed more so i don't i just wonder if long term safety will end up saying years down the road we're going back to the curve because i know myself if i drive west park way when i go home i can't go over 40 very well that's the speed limit in other areas when it's straight ahead and a big wide street and there's not many turns it's easy to accidentally you know whether you like it or not you tend to all of a sudden go faster and that's more of a safety issue so i just wonder if going back to the grid some year down the road we're going to end up finding some issues with car accidents and street safety for people <laughs> so yeah so through your worship to councillor blizzard so the modified grid pattern was something that was identified in the mdp and you're right, the, the straighter a road is, the more you'd feel like you can go faster. But there's tr different traffic calming things that you can do um, to narrow up the road and, and streetscaping and stuff like that. And then just to keep in mind, too, that this is only showing um, collector and arterial roads, right? So your local roads are not necessarily going to be As straight, in okay. this grid pattern. Okay. And I don't know, maybe since I have them on the line, maybe uh, our transportation expert, Dan, Ziegler can add some more information to that if he wants. <laughs> sure, I, I had a feeling that might come. Um, based, I'll just repeat some of the research that we looked into um, when we applied the grid style network. So based on the research, there's an actual expectation for a reduced number of collisions with a uh, grid style network compared to the traditional um, arterial collector local classifications that I think our cities have been accustomed to in the past 30 or 40 years. Um, and so, yeah. And then also in this, in this transportation study, there was a pretty um, extensive review of uh, traffic safety policies that can be considered when the area structure plans are developed. Um, so there, there's an expectation that there would be further study and refinements as the area structure plans are, are created to help mitigate any of those concerns with uh, uh, more direct uh, roadways, potentially leading to um, higher speed. Because un unmitigated straight roads, basically, they well, I think we all understand them as they're it can be a speeding issue to some, but uh, we would expect that area structure plans um, consider that as an issue with this network. But the the, tr the positive trade-offs to this grid-based network is that there is overall improved connectivity throughout the network, and that's for all modes of transportation, including active transportation and servicing transit. So um, I think this is a really good network uh, to service this area, and uh, I. I agree with um, the municipal development plan uh, direction in applying this grid style network for supporting the area. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you have any other questions? I'm um, okay right now. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harris? Yeah, that was kind of a line of questioning I was curious about. I expected that there would probably end up being a modified grid system uh, put in place here, and I think it makes sense. I think if we look at the overall um, 
uh, development of Fort Saskatchewan, which was along a, a river lot context over many years, uh, a lot of that curvilinear uh, transportation came out of the, the constraints the geography put in. But we've got a wide open geography and we've got an open plan to, to come up with a transportation network that makes sense. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I'd say that's correct. Like you said, the land that we've annexed is is more of a you know north south grid or you know not along the angle of the river yeah and so I, I think that's important so ultimately the spine of highway 21 coming in from the south ultimately allows us to jump off and penetrate into those new areas which i thought was was probably what i expected to see <clears throat> so um in in terms of that um the main sanitary line on another question main sanitary line that we put in south fort uh drive uh to service the walmart uh i don't think you were here grant at that point in time but it was very deep and ultimately it was starting to daylight about where it terminates right now so tying in is that where the major tie-in point for the sanitary is to go north ultimately to the siphon under the river uh, through your worship to Councillor Harris. Yeah, it's in that vicinity. So it's uh, basically the intersection of 86th Ave and 101 Street. Right. So that's the main point of uh, conveyance for, for wastewater that's going to be going north uh, to the plant. Yeah, that's the invert that they used um, to, I guess, work backwards for the annexation area. Okay. So everything else ultimately then has to be lifted up into that to be able to then its gravity from there. Well, actually, through this report, it's, they were able to, because that sewer was so deep at 86 and, and 101 and just the contours of the annexation out area, there's no lift station proposed. It's all gravity, except for maybe um, a little bit of area just at the, uh, I guess, west of the city by uh, Point of Pins Estates. So the planning we did it back in the day ultimately has given rise to potentially reduced cost for the servicing of this larger area going forward. Yeah, that's correct. It's eliminated okay. and left stations in that area, yeah. Good, good. Uh, just one last question. So um, looking at that area north of the pipeline right away, uh, which is over near Clover Park and the jail, um, is that under the MDP? I, I haven't looked at the MDP in a while. Is that seen to be an overall residential area? Um, there's the, uh, the Ross Creek green space that goes through there, but to the west of there over towards Siena. Is that on all a residential area as well? So through your worship Councillor Harris, uh, I, I believe so. Like the, we didn't do any land use planning necessarily with this or determine any of that area, but for modeling purposes, yes, we did consider that as residential area. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's what I was curious about in terms of like, if you look at Township Road 544 penetrating east and west, uh, out into Strathcona County. So that area, which would be then east of the jail, ultimately can be developed similar to the way Siena has been developed. That's correct, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, that, those are all, this, this is a highly technical report and how many pages is it, what'd you say? Yeah, and, and ultimately it's, it's generally beyond the purview of elected officials, other than you're bringing it to us to say, here's what you need to know what we're doing. Is that a fair assessment, fair statement? Yes, no, that's, that is a fair statement. It is, is a technical report. But I think there's some items in here that, you know, that council should be aware of, mainly the commission one, I, I think, I feel like, the Wastewater Commission. Okay, okay. thank you, Councillor Noyan. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first question <clears throat> has to do with a statement uh, about the Willow Link extension um, that, that'll happen. So. It says it's been given a curvilinear design to in, or to mitigate potential traffic shortcutting through the annexation area, so it's an increased travel time uh, throughout the neighborhoods to get to Highway 21. If I'm understanding it correctly, where where is the the traffic from? Because it, that that we're trying to to mitigate, because I. As, as I would see it, we would want to funnel traffic from you know, the, the deepest part furthest away from Highway 21 on the southwest side of our city, you know, in the quickest manner possible to get to Highway 21 instead of just slow, slowing it down all residents that are deeper uh, in, in the neighborhoods. So uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan. 
So I don't know, maybe if you can clarify your question, like Willow Link, you know, we're, we're trying to obviously get vehicles onto the highway, right? Or onto arterial roads and, yes, and, and, which, and the which highway. does happen already and that's going to happen. But why, why are we trying to traffic calm uh, like with an extension of Willow Link, which will occur in the annexation area instead of increased traffic flow? Because it says here the words are increased travel time. And that doesn't seem like a beneficial thing for, for residents deeper in that area. Dan has his hand up there. Oh, sure. Well, then, yes, go ahead, Dan. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Joey. Um, to Councillor through the Mayor. Uh, so the intention that's of the increased travel time is to, it's, it's the, there's a concern of people shortcutting north-south parallel to Highway 21 because Willow Link is a north-south um, roadway. So we want it, so I agree, we, we want people, we want drivers to filter to 20, Highway 21 and we want, we don't, we, through creating increased travel time, we're hoping that the uh, that produces um, a longer route so that drivers actually will connect onto the, the arterial and collector roads that filter onto Highway 21, rather than potentially speeding down Willow Link through these uh, future residential neighborhoods and avoiding Highway 21 altogether, say from the uh, West Park area down to the Southwest border of uh, the annexation area right so, yeah thank you for that and I, I guess i don't understand the logic uh, logic of it quite like uh, the the way the way you're saying it because if, if you argue that south ford boulevard uh you know is it it is a, a place for for traffic to to go through fort saskatchewan without having to access highway 21 and similarly to the way the people would bypass highway 21 on the west side of of the highway like it's it's a lot further away if you're talking about West Park Boulevard, 84th, and what will be um, Willow Link extension through the annexation area. So I don't really see that as being uh, a potential for people bypassing 21, if you understand that, right? Because I mean the proximity to 21 is so far away that it's not gonna, it's not it shouldn't impact in my mind traffic that is already would be funneling through the the main highway but that's just some thoughts perhaps if you want to comment on it further you you can but uh, like i i see what the, the intention of your the plan is sure i think we appreciate the comment and um through future area structure plans that can will be something that could be will be looked at and i'll pass it off back to the city if they want to comment further. And the only other thing that I would maybe add is there is there is a wetland kind of north there, right, where the Willow Link would have to naturally probably curve around anyway, so it probably couldn't run as, as a straight direct route. But um, so there could be some topography issues there too or, or some of the reasons why we curve that road. Okay, thank you. So I'm going on to round two. So um, top of speaking order. So the question that I have, again, when I look at this, so are you, is it the intention that there would be another one, two, three, four major intersections that would be along the highway or how it, because I'm looking at this and you've got the red lines going across, you've got the yellow lines going across. So is it the intent to have like four more intersections as we move into the annexed area? So through your worship, uh, the intent is to have two more all directional intersections. So intersections with traffic lights. Uh, the other lines that you're seeing is proposed right in, right out for possible commercial areas and then two um, possible grade separated um, pedestrian crossings. Oh, okay. And then the other question that I have is you've got Ellard Way uh, progressing across South Fort Boulevard into the new annexed area. I thought um, a couple of years ago or something when we were talking about that, that, um, that Ellard Way was supposed to end at South Ridge Boulevard and the new annexed area was primarily supposed to be serviced uh, on its own. 
and not have so many links into into the existing areas. Does anybody recall that? Um, and I, this is a little bit vague for me, so I'm not going to... It. I think when we had those discussions, um, we were looking within our borders. It was... Um, it was pre-annexation discussions. It was um, at that time we um, weren't looking for those connections outside those existing boundaries. Um, as new development patterns occur, this just creates a little bit more linkage between the communities on the major roadways. Um, it still links into South Ridge Boulevard as the you know the primary arterial. Um, that comes through. So it still has that connection. It just has the ability to go a little bit further south as well. Okay. And I have to ask that question because I, I know for certain that I sat up here and we were told when the new annexed areas came on to alleviate the traffic congestion and flows like that were in Southport, that they wouldn't have a whole bunch of uh, additional connections. So you're telling me that's changed. Um, your worship, I don't remember that comment specifically, so I'm not. I, I, I would say that I guess it has changed, if, if that's your recollection on it. Um, but the the intent is to provide alternatives for people, um, and and not the hierarchy of roads again would put people on the arterial roads rather than the the tighter collectors and into the locals. So the if you're unless you're going somewhere within South Point from the south or what is now South Point now, you likely wouldn't take that roadway. Your Worship, if I could add to Mr. Schaefer, um, there was a strategic decision to not extend South Fort Drive into the annex lands uh, for the reasons that were described. We don't want this to parallel Veterans Way. And um, it was intentional to ensure that there was a break there. So I'm wondering, there is the potential that that is the conversation that you may be referring to. Okay. And I admit, maybe, maybe I am uh, confused on that, but uh, okay, I'll accept what you're telling me. Councillor Harris? Um, so with the um, curve, or with the uh, modified grid network that we've got here, um, do we anticipate that the future state of development will not have front-facing lots onto these major collectors or major arterials? Because I would hate to see that we'd get into another situation where we have to get into an argument or a discussion with the developer about putting front-facing lots on a major collector, my opinion, my terminology, on West Park Drive. And from the time it was originally designed, it was always deemed to be rear-facing lots. And then we're, we're forced into a situation where we in my in my opinion, reluctantly had to agree with front facing lots on a, on a section of West Park Drive. So going forward with this proposed transportation network, ultimately it's going to be servicing networks will ultimately back out onto this network, transportation network. Is that a fair assessment? Because I, I would hate to get into a situation where we have to get into future arguments with developers who want to uh, maximize their development by having front-facing lots on major uh, collectors. And then we end up with situations like we have on the Ring Road in Pineview. Great. So uh, through your worship to Councillor Harris. So this, uh, this report is obviously just laying out the roads. Our current engineering standards um, is where you would find, like, not the planning documents, our engineering standards do allow uh, for access um, to a collector road. They do not allow like driveways, houses to front an arterial road. So the plan with this is like there would be no houses that would front arterial roads. Um, right now in our current standards, they are allowed to uh, front a collector road. So, but with the distribution of the uh, grid network you've got here, most of these would be major collectors. Correct. Um, I don't think that we ended up defining them as major or minor. We just identified them as collector. I've got Dan, who's got his hand up again. Yeah, sorry, Dan. Can't see you. <laughs> I can see him. You can't. That's that's, that's okay. Oh, um, just to add through the mayor to the councilor, uh, to add to that, our report identifies in Table Three Point One. Um, which I believe is consistent with the city's engineering standards. Uh, it, whether 
access front driveway access would be permitted or not and defining whether a collector is a major sorry access is depending on whether a collector is a major or minor and it's likely that the collectors shown on this plan are all major um, but that would be uh, verified once the traffic impact assessments are done with the area structure plans but for major collectors there would be no uh, front driveway access permitted that's recommended through this study of course that's always open and subject to discussion through the area structure plan development but uh, on minor collectors um, their uh, front access would be allowed based on the uh, standards in place so yeah. hopefully that helps yeah I, and i'm not going to argue that point i think ultimately it comes down to uh, changes that were made in our municipal development plan that ultimately gave rise to the situation of west park um, I probably wasn't as fully aware as I should have been in relation to that change, and I should have spoke more, more vehemently about it at the time. So we, we got far enough down the road there uh, that it became an issue, and, and ultimately we ended up having to give some latitude to the developer to allow that to happen. Um, I think we're going to have to have a conversation as a council from a policy perspective with our administration in relation to the things that we want to see in future development so that the technical work you've done here from a servicing standpoint, from a transportation ingress and egress context, uh, allows council of the day as this thing starts to see the light of day and we start to actually populate the recommendations you brought forward. Um, it gives us an opportunity to really understand the magnitude of some of that stuff so that we, we see that we're being consistent with our overall municipal development planning process and the, the layouts that ultimately give rise to, uh, to development in the future. So that would be a, an observation that I would make to our city manager in relation and our manager of, of infrastructure. Uh, that allows council to have a more fulsome discussion going forward. I, I see this as an evolutionary document. I appreciate it. It's it's highly technical, and uh, most of us would have a hard time grab, you know, gr grabbing onto it and making sense with it. Other than we know somebody's doing what they have to do, so that we're we're doing good planning. So I hope that we are able to have an opportunity to have a discussion about these things that ensure that our our plans and our and our our, our design framework is is in sync going forward. So, you know, thank you for getting to this point. This is this is always interesting stuff, in my opinion. Um, but those are some of my concerns and some of the questions I guess I had relative to transportation and concerns and obje uh, you know objections that can arise over time. So, thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Noyan. <clears throat> Yeah, I just so hopefully have a, a short question on wetlands and developing in wetlands. So we, we've seen a few of them here. Some are going, or I guess one is going to remain crown. Um, so we, we, we've seen a development in Fort Saskatchewan that has had some risks and we're, we're obviously paying for those, uh, you know, decision to develop on a wetland. That, what, what assurances do we have in place uh, that that is going to mitigate or or eliminate that risk in the future if a developer decides to, um, yeah, yeah, you know, to develop on, on those types of parcels. Like, I guess maybe uh, yeah. is there a, is there an in-depth geotechnical report that we can, you know, the city can be sure that there isn't going to be surface water that is going to be created from anything below a certain depth or I, I'm not sure how that works exactly. Sure. So uh, through your worship to Councillor Noyan. So there's a few things. So wetlands typically are the low lying areas on that parcel of land, right? So they're the best for suited for um, future stormwater management pet ponds or facilities, um, you know, for the ones that aren't going to be claimed by the Crown. Um, during the ASP and SP phases, there would be geotechnical studies that would be completed as well, which those would identify, you know, um, groundwater and high water tables and, and stuff like that, right? So um, that work will all be done further as uh, as development is planned ahead. Okay, and so we would we would see this from the during the ASP phase. If there are any concerns, this is something that would be brought towards council. It's a very simple answer, right? I, I think. Yeah, correct. And I just one other thing, like we 
when we started to see the issues that I think you're referring to, we did make some changes to our standards where, you know, we didn't allow some pumps to drain to the surface anymore and we connected to them to the storm system. And, and so that's kind of mitigated some of those um, groundwater issues that we've seen as well. All right. Okay. That's good. That's good enough for now. Thanks. Okay. I think that looks like about all the questions. Uh, so just final questions. I know you talked about next steps and I asked about, the Landrix ASP, and then, and then the next steps for the South Fort one. So, just remind us again what to expect. So, to your worship, so uh, the ASP and S NSP process now that Landrix is undertaking is is done by the developer, obviously in consultation with the city at different different points. So, my understanding is that they'll just continue working on that. And then, sorry, it was the levies, was your... No, the the other side. Oh, the cell Ford ASP? Yeah. Uh, I believe um, planning is doing that work, and that should happen in the next couple months, is the amendment to the cell Ford ASP. Okay, so when you talk about the amendment to the Southport ASP, so the new annex lands, are we calling that Southport ASP as well? No, sorry, to clarify, so there's, in the current cell Ford ASP... For the South Fort neighborhood, yeah. Out of this study, we made some altercations to the road network and layout. So, because we made some altercations to better connect into the annex lands, we got to do. We have to make some amendments to the South Fort ASP. Okay. So yeah. there's no the only ASP work that's being done right now currently in the annex lands is, is Landrex. Okay, so then we won't see anything that's uh, south of South Southridge Boulevard until somebody comes forward with a uh, new ASP. That's correct. Okay, that's where I got to get my head wrapped around this. So we won't see that side for a while then. Okay, yep. awesome. Well, thank you very much for your presentation here today. And uh, Councillor Harris is right. There's a lot of technical information on here, and I'm sure there'll be lots of conversation about what goes where as stuff comes forward. But um, very, very good for uh, first round of this. So thank you. All right. Okay, we are on to, are there any councillor inquiries of administration? Not seeing any. I'm told there is no need for an in-camera session. So if there is nothing else, then I will declare that we are adjourned at 422. Thank you very much.